All right. Hello and welcome to Around the Horns, the show where we are talking about everything about the University of Texas baseball team. I am Aaron. I am here, as always, with my co-host, Zach. We are recording this on Thursday afternoon. Texas did not have a midweek game this week, but they are coming off a series win in Fort Worth against TCU. Zach, we've had a couple of days off here. Uh, what are your what are you how are you feeling? And uh, what are your first initial thoughts on the uh, big victory in, in, in Fort Worth? Yeah, really good victory in Fort Worth. Um, you know, going through the first first game, it was exactly what you wanted to see. And then a little bit nervous in the second game. And then Sunday, or well, I guess Monday, because they shifted a week uh, or a day back. Yeah, you know, not exactly pretty, but had Tuesday off, which was interesting. Got some extra sleep in, you know, time some fishing and yeah, feeling good. Ready, ready to hit the home stretch here. Yeah, I mean, the... Uh... Oh, well, we still have listed Friday, Saturday, Sunday here. The the whole week got thrown off because of rain. So Texas ended up playing Saturday, Sunday. Then we had Monday afternoon baseball, which is uh, which is always strange. But on Saturday in that uh, game one of the series, it was a Lucas Gordon show once again, man. The the wind was blowing out like crazy in Fort Worth. There was one point where I've, I've got my TV set up where I was watching Texas, of course, in the middle, and the wind was just blowing out like a bajillion miles an hour. Then on the left, I had... Uh, the Diamondbacks and the Rockies in Coors Field, where the ball is just always jetting like crazy. And then on the right, I had <laughs> the Mexico City game, where they were playing 40% elevated more than Coors with like the dimensions of Great American Ballpark. So I was just, my eyes were just flying around. It was just like home run, home run, home run. <laughs> it, was, it was just a horrible experience for me as a guy that likes to watch 1 0 baseball games with a bunch of strikeouts. But Nonetheless, yeah. the wind did not bother Lucas Gordon. He goes eight runs. He does get, he goes eight, he goes eight innings, does give up four runs in part because of the wind, he allows six hits. But it was a huge performance once again, because as we know right now, one of the main things Texas is looking for out of Lucas Gordon is innings because they have 27 innings they have to cover on a given weekend. Not many great pitchers to cover them. Lucas Gordon is maybe the lone great pitcher to help out and for him to pitch in eight on on a game one on saturday that was that was huge yeah you, you you mentioned a career high eight innings um this is one of the things we've wanted out of lucas for really two years now to be able to release and, and just really go out there and compete but keep the pitch count down early so that he can have something left to get in there and um you know he still threw 115 pitches but he he just went out there and worked he was just freaking yeoman out there pitch after pitch so it was it was really nice to see yeah, no, and the offense was able to give him a lead, which was good, and, and because of the you know the friendly hitting conditions, and then David Pierce uh, this weekend definitely shook up the lineup a little bit. We saw our guy Jared Thomas move all the way up to lead off. Uh, Eric Kennedy been slumping a little bit, slid down to the seven hole, and then uh, Tanner Carlson was the DH for most of the weekend. Um, Zach Eric Kennedy, uh, permanent seven hole, I guess he homered in his first two at bats in the seven hole. I mean, I wrote about it on Saturday, but. He might be like one of the most dangerous seven hole hitters uh, that college baseball has seen in quite some time when you just factor in his experience and his speed. And then obviously the pop that he showed there in game one. Yeah. You know, it, Kennedy was just, he was lights out. He was ready. He was prepared. And, um, you know, the first one, he was just able to get up in the airstream and let it carry the second one. He actually, you know, put a good charge into it. Um, so that was, that was really good to see. And, you know, I don't, I don't hate it actually, because then you're able to turn that bottom of the lineup over much easier. You're getting a guy like Jared Thomas at the top who doesn't look like a freshman anymore. You know, he's putting really good at bats. He's getting on base, whether it's a walk or a single. He's got the speed to lay down a bunt single too, which we saw. So, yeah, I actually, you know, EK might not love it sitting down there in the, the seven hole, but hey, I'm here for it. Let leave him down there. Let him just continue to work. <laughs> I bet I bet he didn't mind it on Saturday when he was just down there getting fastballs and sending them over the wall. But yeah, I mean, you talk about Jerry Thomas in the leadoff, like it might not be something you would normally expect. You'd be like, oh, we have our first baseman hitting our left-handed first baseman hitting leadoff. That's kind of weird. But I mean, when you think about Jerry Thomas, you're like, okay, he's very fast. He's very athletic. They've talked about how they like him on the bases. And yeah. then um, he's been drawing walks lately, which you talked about. His at-bats have been a lot better. So You've got a fast guy that can get on base a lot. You know, who cares what position he plays? You know, you throw him up there at leadoff, and uh, that that worked out pretty well. But, yeah, Texas, uh, you know, TCU went to the bullpen, slowed him down a little bit. But Lucas Gordon did his thing, uh, handed it off to Heston Toll, just came in, just threw a bunch of Heston Toll sliders, and uh, that was that was it. Nice little game one victory there. Yeah, that uh, 
I do want to give a shout out to old Jack O'Dad though. <laughs> he he hit yeah. a ball up in the air and he hung his head. He's like, oh God. And then he looks at me, he's like, oh, it's keep going. It just it kept caught carrying in the wind. Just, I mean, it probably fell one foot more than the top of the fence. Like it was inches from scraping. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that's when you know the wind is gusting. When you have a non-power hitter like O'Dowd hit a fly ball to the opposite field and he thinks it has no shot and then it <laughs> carries over the wall. You're like, all right, there might be, there might be a little gust up there today. Um, that was good to see. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was a lot of, um, a lot of loud contact or maybe not even loud contact, but a lot of runs put on the board early, which helped Texas out quite a bit. And then you go to Sunday. Um, we, we were thinking maybe LBJ would get the start. It was actually DJ Burke that uh, got first dibs on the mound. He was all right. You know, he was out there, he was throwing strikes, which was fine. But, um, you know, he, he, when he's in the zone, he's going to get hit around a little bit by good offenses, which TCU is a good offense, but nonetheless, he went out there for a couple innings and kept Texas in it. Um, but then the story was LBJ after that, Zach, I don't know what the deal is with the whole LBJ situation because like, it's been pretty clear now for like three, four weeks that like LBJ is the second best pitcher on this team. Like he's the second yeah. best starting pitcher on this team, but like, he's not the starting pitcher because they keep bringing him out of the bullpen for this, you know, long relief, you know, very important long relief role where he goes six and a third out of the pin allows three hits, six Ks, no runs, zero walks. Um, very importantly, but it's, it's just been interesting to see, like, I don't know what the deal is. You know, next time we get to talk to the team, I'm definitely going to ask about it. Just to be like, is he more comfortable not pitching the first thing, not starting? And they like just bringing him out of the pin because if you just treat it like, you know, just like a normal baseball team, you'd be like, all right, Lucas Gordon's our best pitcher. He's pitching Friday. You know, LBJ is our second best pitcher. He's starting game two, but they, they don't seem to want to start him for whatever reason. I think maybe that'll be the case. Maybe they will start him this weekend. We'll see, but it's been a little strange to see them, but I mean, nonetheless, he's been, he's been pretty dominant lately. I believe he is allowed two. I'll go double check this, but he's allowed two runs or fewer in like six of his past seven outings. So he, yeah. he's been pretty consistent for a while now. Yeah, I know. He's been really good. Uh, Coach Pierce talked about his command of the splitter has been really impressive because let's face it, a splitter is not an easy pitch to throw anyways. Um, yeah, I mean, he, uh, they just did not look comfortable at bats against um, against LBJ. I mean, TCU was clearly like, holy moly, what did we run into? This guy is just pounding him. At the, and he was. I mean, they were pitcher perfect at the bottom of the zone. They, it was exactly where you wanted to see. And the few hits that he did give up, one of them was chest level. Like, he left it up, you know, it was hammered into to the field, right? And so – um, but the thing for me is, you know, six innings, that's really impressive for him. Only giving up three hits is really impressive. Six Ks is really nice, but the zero walks because the, the line on him has been at some point, he's going to lose his release point or he's going to lose his ability to hit the bottom of the zone consistently. And, you know, he's going to walk some guys. And I thought he did a, a just an outstanding job. You know, everyone was really excited to see, uh, LBJ out there and, yeah, I, it sounds like he's starting on Saturday against Kansas. That's what Pierce has intimated. But yeah, to your point, you know, I thought he might have started against TCU. So, I, you know, maybe he doesn't like the first inning. He's got the first inning like jitters and then he's comfortable. I I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. Now, who knows what the deal is? But yeah, I mean, I checked it out. So LeBaron Johnson Jr., of his last seven outings, six of them, he has allowed either one earned run or zero earned runs. So he's been good for a while now. He's definitely worthy of, you know, being the number two starter. We'll see if that does in fact happen this weekend against Kansas. But um, yeah, no, I mean, Texas was able to get the job done on Sunday too. It's always, and, oh, uh, of course we got to, we got to talk about the ending there on Sunday. Um, <laughs> little Porter Brown uh, revenge, revenge game, revenge series. Um, TCU has the tying run at third base with one out in the ninth, you know, batter hits a, hits a pretty lazy fly ball out to Porter and pretty shallow left field. Um, TCU's, I believe it was catcher, is on third base running. Yeah. Their base coach doesn't care. He's ready to send it. He's seen that Porter Brown arm. I guess he didn't respect it. Uh, <laughs> definitely didn't respect it enough because Porter Brown caught it, fired a laser to the plate. It wasn't really on target, but he had so much time and he threw it so hard that yeah. Guillemette had more than enough time just to kind of run over, catch it, run back, and put a nice tag on the guy um, to end the game. Um, what a great scene that was. I mean, Texas jumping up and down, you know, Guillemette spikes the ball. Anytime you can secure the series um, in the first two games, that is a really good feeling. 
you just knowing you, you don't have as much pressure, you can go out there, go for the sweep in game three. But that, that was a pretty uh, one of the one of the more exciting innings that we've had this year. Yeah, that was that was really um, that was a lot of fun for the end of that game. And you know, if you look at the offensive from both sides, right, like not just LBJ was shutting him down. Luis Rodriguez, the freshman from TCU, yeah. really did a good job. And, um, you know, if you look at the win offensively, that was just a team win. Jared Thomas gets on. He steals second. Powell brings him in with an RBI single is, you know, um, or no, they bunted, I, they bunted him over actually, if I remember correctly, yeah. bunted Thomas over. And so, yeah, it's just, that was Augie ball to perfection, right? They, they got him over and they, they drove him in. Um, so that was really fun. It definitely, uh, I got tired of seeing Elijah Nunez though, because every single game he, he lead led off with a single, like Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, he was just a lead off singles machine. Um, so I really got tired of seeing that guy at the plate. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean he had a big series, and then you know we can move we can move to game three here, and it was it was TCU's day, that's for sure. They come out nineteen hits. Um, they they just end up kind of beating the crap out of Texas in in game three. This is you know this is the big difference when we talk about all right. Texas did a better job for the most part of throwing strikes this weekend. It's important to throw strikes. You don't want to give away free passes. You don't want to give away give away free runs, but when you run into a team on the road again, like a team like TCU on the road, just throwing strikes is not good enough. I mean, this is, this is division one college baseball. You have to be able to throw quality strikes in the right spot with multiple pitches. And this was just a good example of just throwing strikes is not going to be good enough, especially for this staff that only has a couple guys with like overpowering stuff. This needs to be a staff where they're not only throwing strikes, but they're throwing, you know, balls in the corner, you know, multiple pitches, any given count, different pitches. Um, and uh, yeah, didn't work out. 19 hits for TCU in the blowout victory on Monday. But, uh, you know, nothing's more important than getting the win. But, you know, of course, the main storyline there was Tanner Witt finally makes his return to the mound. That was so awesome to see him just back on the mound warming up there. What, what were your initial thoughts when you just... What were your emotions as you seen him take the mound and then your, your thoughts on his performance? Yeah, no, I was, I was really happy to see him back out there. Um, talked to his family a bunch over the past, what, three years now. And, you know, you couldn't find a more likable guy, a more likable family that, you know, they're all burn orange. They, they're all there for it. Um, you know, he's been injured. He's not even playing. And he, you see his family at the ballpark. So every often. game, yeah, every game they, yeah. they're there for it. Right. And, um, so it was, it was really cool to see that and just, the, you know, you could tell that it meant something to the team. Um, you know, he came out, I, he wasn't particularly sharp. I didn't think he would be though. Right. Like he's coming off of 12 months without having thrown a real game. You know, he's thrown live batters, but not a real game. You could tell the emotion was there for him. He was, he was amped up. Um, you know, he had good spin rate still on his curveball. Um, he was having trouble commanding that in out, which I'm sure he's so used to like, historically like he he can just dot the eye on either side right but um you could tell that when he was throwing you could tell he was trying to go for an outside corner and it was coming way in or was coming way in when he was trying to go out and so it, it, the command will come but he was up to 94 um i think well, this curveball was sitting at 76 like i said it still had good spin rate still had good shape on it so yeah it's you know he said he felt good after the game he said he felt good to pierce during the midweek you know during his bullpen so I, that's really all you can hope for at this point. And uh, yeah, it was really good to see him. Yeah. I mean, he, he was clearly jacked up on the mound. I mean, how, how could you not be, he was, he was fired up. He was losing his mechanics a little bit, you know, kind of unlike Tanner Whip, but just nothing you wouldn't expect first time out. Um, you know, it probably uh, just to add to it, there was about 70, 70 scouts behind home plate. So you're <laughs> out there. Everyone's telling you, all right, first inning out, just go out there, throw some strikes, take it easy. Then you take the mound and you've got all your natural emotions, then you look behind the plate and you've got 70 guys just pointing the radar gun at you, you know, evaluating what slot you're going to get picked in. So like every, every, you know, additional miles per hour you throw, could be worth like a million dollars. You know, there's just a lot of thoughts going through your head. So yeah, the scout stuff was hilarious because, you know, Whit, he throws his two thirds of an inning. Um, then you look up in like the second inning, Chase Loomis is in, I guess the scouts did not want to stay for Chase Loomis. I thought that was weird. Um, yeah. It was, I mean, it just gives you a little peek into the life of a scout, man. They are there to scout their guy, and then they are out. Because yeah. the moment David Pierce went out to the mound to take Tanner Wood out, those scouts just went flying towards the exit. Um, 
it was, yeah, it was something to see there. Just, just goes to show how big of a deal Tanner Witt is. And, you know, when you get these limited outings at the end of a college season coming off an injury, it's going to be like that every single game of his because those major league teams need to see how he's throwing, how his arm's reacting, you know, how the ball is spinning. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I expect him to do, you know, he'll be, he'll be good going forward. Um, we expect that pitch count to be bumped up a little bit this weekend against Kansas. So you can probably expect somewhere in the 30 to 40 pitch range to maybe hopefully three innings if he's pitching well. So you can look for that um, on this Sunday, but yeah, I mean, they, they've just got to keep running him out there, you know, build that pitch count up 10 to 15 pitches every single outing. And then hopefully you look up in the, in the big 12 tournament and the regional and he can give you, you know, 50, 60 ish pitches. And that's, you know, that's not nothing that, 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 that could matter quite a bit if you get yeah. to a regional and, Tanner Witt can give you 60 sharp pitches. Um, still a long way away from that. You know, every single week is going to be a process for him, but you know, that is, that is probably the end goal. And that would be a pretty big deal there for a Texas team that we know, you know, anyone that can give them quality outs, that is a big deal. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And the, you know, the other thing you mentioned, the 19 hits, um, I felt like when TCU came out, they were just hunting fast. They were sitting dead red. They weren't looking at breaking ball stuff. They were so used to what, um, all the change-ups and all of the sliders and the splitters that they got from LBJ and and from Heston Toll and from Gordon, they were like, screw it, we're sitting dead red with all these guys. And that's they did, they just pounded the rock. I mean, it was just hitting it right back up the middle a lot of times, or you just looping them into left field. It wasn't like they were hitting for a bunch of power, it was just single after single, death by singles. They did have the big three-run home run, which I felt really changed the momentum of that game. Texas had gotten down early gotten back and they were right there and then that three run blast just really you know that's all tcu needed and they just kind of took off from there and it really it really affected texas um the other thing to mention about tanner with those everyone forgets that he was voted as one of the pitchers of the year preseason all the coaches knowing that he's not going to pitch for you know the first you know three quarters of the season and they're like no no he's still that good we're still going to award him because he's that freaking good. So yeah. Yeah. No, that was that was cool to see. Um, the other thing that was cool to see, Dylan Campbell. Don't look now, man, but that hit streak is up to 23 games. The school record is 25, held by Michael Torres. Um, it's pretty impressive to get up to a 23 game hit streak in this era, Zach, because I mean a lot of people call it now the three true outcomes being, you know, everyone's going up there, they're looking, you know, they're looking for a home run, they're looking for a walk, or they might strike out. So to be able to bank, you know, a 23 game hitting streak in this kind of new era of baseball, pretty impressive. Um, you know, he obviously he can tie it with hits on Friday and Saturday, and then he might be able to break the record on Sunday. You know, this this Kansas pitching staff, we're about to preview that series here in a second. Not not nothing special on the pitching staff there. I think D.C., you know, we'll see. But seems like he's got a pretty decent shot at this thing. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that's really special about DC. You know, you mentioned it. He can launch the ball a long way. He's got a special at-bat contact and power. And But it is, same thing is he's just as happy to hit one up the middle to advance guys or hit one into right field. Um, it wasn't a particularly good game either on him, for him on Monday. I think he had two or three strikeouts going into that. At-bat, at he was over three. And, uh, you know, everyone talks about it, but the, his ability to shorten up with two strikes – and just get a barrel on the ball is it's really impressive. You know, I'm, if scouts aren't taking notice, they should, because this is a guy that like Antico or like Murphy, he's just, he's a born hitter. That's what he's known for. Um, so he doesn't have a lot of leg kick, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have a lot of the fancy, you know, tools. He's, he's pretty quiet in the box. He's got really, really fast hands and he knows how to extend. So it, that was really cool to see. Yeah, and Michael Torres, the streak was at 25 during his time. Which and he's related to, of course, Kate O'Hara. Yep. Um, so that'd be pretty cool to uh to see DC break his his hit streak. And Torres has been to a couple of games this season out in Occupy Left Field. So send him out to Kansas, you know. Make, right. make, send him to Kansas. Make him go out there to, to see his record get shattered, man. <laughs> yeah, that'd be funny. Um, yeah. So I mean, with that, Texas now is at fourth in the Big 12 in the Big 12 standings. Um, West Virginia is still sitting up there at the top. Zach, I will give you a chance here to update everyone on where Texas is at in the standings, you know, maybe some regional projections, RPI update, all that good stuff that you always love uh, looking into. Go ahead and uh, give the people an update on where Texas stands as they are currently, you know, in a, in route to Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah. So if you look at the standings right now, it's West Virginia, Oklahoma state, Kansas state, Texas, Texas tech. Um, 
and then it doesn't matter after that. No, <laughs> so it's uh, you know, everyone's kind of a jumble right there. So West Virginia's got a three game lead on Oklahoma State and Kansas State, who are tied at 11 and seven. But if you look, they have played one series less. And so realistically, or maybe not realistically, based on the way they've been pitching and hitting is, you know, they could either run away with it this weekend or they could be brought back down to earth by OU and really open up a shot for Oklahoma State, Kansas State, or even Texas to to really jump in. Um, Texas is one game back of Oklahoma State and Kansas State. If you look at their existing schedule or the remaining schedules, though, you got to feel good about where Texas sits as compared to a Kansas State. So, I mean, I think third place is a very healthy spot for Texas to finish up at um, with an outside chance that maybe they're able to catch Oklahoma State if if things go well for them. Um, with West Virginia having that that three game lead, I think that's really tough to overcome, but they have to play tough games, right? If you look at the remaining schedule, West Virginia has Oklahoma this weekend at home. They have Texas Tech at home, and then they're at Texas. That's that's not those aren't gimme series, right? Oklahoma's shown that they can go in and beat folks, um, and they've they've flashed, you know, where they've been good. Texas Tech, we know that they can hit the ball, and Kansas came into West Virginia earlier this season and and battered up or and batted up on West Virginia, so. Maybe they can hit the the pitching that no one else has been able to. And then, you know, West Virginia at Texas is really anyone's ball game. So I think that'll be really telling. If you look at Texas RPI, they're at 27. Their strength of schedule is at 16. So they're they're on that cusp of being good enough to be a regional host, but not quite. You know, they really just realistically need to be top 20. Um, the biggest issue with that going forward is that if you look at the RPI teams they have to play yet, Kansas, UTA, San Jose State, and West Virginia, it's 115, 88, 124, and then 15. So maybe the best thing to happen for Texas is West Virginia wins out until they get to Texas and Texas were to beat them because you want to keep that RPI at 15 as high as and long as possible for West Virginia because they really need that, that last weekend series. So yeah, it's, it's possible, but I just don't see him being a, a host. Uh, the latest D1 projection has Texas as a two seed. In the Dallas Baptist Regional, and if you look at the regional, you cut, start thinking, I, yeah. "I like this, right?" Dallas Baptist, San Houston, Texas, and NC State—that's a very winnable series yeah. um, or regional, I should say. So you can't be mad. It's better than being sent off to you know Arkansas or you know one of those. So <laughs> it's, we'll see what happens. Um, interestingly enough, Oklahoma State is projected to be a 13 overall seed. I. I don't know that I agree with that. I think their schedule is a little weak, but they got an 18 RPI and, you know, they're second in the big 12. So that's usually a pretty good indicator. K-State's projected to be a three seed in the Arkansas regional, but with a 58 RPI and K-State still having to play, uh, who does K-State still have to play? They still have to play Oklahoma State and TCU, I believe. I just don't see him coming out of that with a big enough RPI to really push them in. I think they might miss the tournament. Um, Texas Tech is a three seed in the Eugene Regional. Again, RPI of 59. So Texas Tech has West Virginia and Kansas left. They they really need to put together a big weekend against West Virginia what next weekend to really solidify their spot in the tournament because they're one of the last couple out. So which is um, hilarious yeah. because Texas Tech, what was it one week or two weeks ago where they were ranked 14th? Which, last week they were ranked 14th yeah. in the nation. Yeah. So I and then they lose to K State at home. So I mean, yeah. it, the Big Twelve is so topsy turny turny this year. It's crazy. Um, and then West Virginia, like I said, they have 15 RPI, but they're currently projected as a 10 overall seed. I don't see that happening. But look, they got JJ Weatherholt, who has just been blasting the ball, and they got two really good pitching uh, starters. So this is the year of the Mountaineer, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's interesting when you talk about how, you know, West Virginia is the team Texas is trying to track down if they do want to somehow, you know, win the Big 12 regular season title. But at the same time, West Virginia kind of getting hot here and boosting their RPI, you know, for that, um, you know, last series in Austin against Texas, that could potentially help Texas out. So it's like, you know, if you're if you're if the main goal is to host a regional, you probably want West Virginia to keep doing well. But of course, there's like the common sense goal. It's like, we just want to win the big 12 title, which is always like a big goal at the beginning of the year. So <laughs> always interesting uh, how that can play out. But I was looking at the West Virginia thing. So I think, you know, at this point, how the standings lie, if you're Texas, you just want to be within three of West Virginia going into that final series to where at least 
you give yourself a chance for a sweep. You, you win the Lucas Gordon game. LBJ goes, he goes full LSU game on Saturday. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you roll into Sunday with a chance to sweep all the pressures on those guys. And that's all you can really ask for. So if you look at the records right now, if you give Texas a sweep of Kansas, that would put Texas at 13 and eight. And then say uh, West Virginia, they've got Oklahoma, then they've got tech. If you give them four and two, then that puts West Virginia at 15 and six. So in that scenario, you're only two games back. And then if Texas goes two and one against Kansas, and then West Virginia goes four and two over those, then you're three games back, which is still, you've at least got a shot. But things get interesting. If West Virginia were to, you know, only go three and three against Texas Tech and Oklahoma, that puts them at 14 and seven. Then if Texas sweeps Kansas, you've got Texas coming in at 13 and eight. Then things start to get a little interesting. You you go out there, you win the Lucas Gordon game. All of a sudden you're tied for first going into Saturday. You know, the crowd starts going crazy. That could get interesting. So, yeah, um, Texas fans are in the worst possible scenario um, that any fan, any Texas fan could ever be in, which is we've got to root for the Oklahoma Sooners this weekend. Needing help from the Sooners is never the spot you want to be in, but that is the scenario nonetheless. But yeah, Yeah. I just want to throw that out there. I do think it is definitely within the realm of possibility that Texas will be within three of West Virginia going into that final weekend series. You know, not that we expect Texas to sweep West Virginia, but at least you would, you know, at least you could pitch that to the team. It would be something you could still have on the table going into that final weekend. Yeah. And if you talk about, you know, Disney made movies, storylines, Texas is going into that final day. And it's going to be a third. It's always Thursday, Friday, Saturday to end the season. True. Yeah. Yeah. You go into that final Saturday and you got Tanner Witt starting with a chance to win the big 12. Yeah. You know, Goodness gracious. Talk about adrenaline. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's what we need. So that, that's the reason you got to be pulling for Oklahoma this weekend against West Virginia. And then, yeah, I mean, Texas needs two out of one bare minimum. Obviously a uh, sweep would be very good for the horns this weekend, but in order to do that, they are going to have to go through the big, bad, mighty Kansas Jayhawks. Zach, uh, let's talk a little bit about Kansas and what they are bringing to the table here. Yeah. You know, they're 21 and 24 on the year, um, six and 12 in the big 12 which to be honest, I, I'm actually impressed by that last year. They had guys like um, Josenberger, Maui Ahuna. They had some, you know, better pitchers and they went four and 20. Um, yeah. So, you know, talk about the job that uh, Dan Fitzgerald has done. He was an assistant at DBU. We mentioned them earlier. He hit the portal hard. They brought in 18 different guys to try and turn this thing around, turn the roster over. Um, and they had, a, like I said, they had they lost a lot of talent, you know, a guy like, Ahuna, a guy like Yosenberger, it wasn't guys that they were just, you know, randomly throwing out. It was, it was guys that they projected out to be really high level people. And if they still had an up and down year, right? Their RPI is 115. They were swept by TCU. They were swept by BU, uh, Baylor, but then they won the series against West Virginia. They're the only the second team this year that's beat West Virginia in a three game series. The other one being Georgia Southern to start the season. So you know, I don't know what magic they found in the Mountaineer land, but somehow they came with a two and away record out there. But then they got swept by K State and they got swept by Oklahoma State. And so, you know, it's just they've had a lot of sweeps, which bodes well for Texas. Um, and some of those sweeps were at home, like um they got swept by K State at home, which you never want to see. They got swept by Oklahoma State at home. So two of the better teams, obviously, but um you know, if, if TCU can sweep at Kansas, that Texas should be able to as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, the, they, they've definitely been on a slide lately. It, it yeah. hasn't been great. Um, you know, they stole some games early in the year. But the one thing that really jumped out to me when I was looking at it is they only have five steals in conference. So Texas has been playing a lot of teams lately. You know, you think of, you know, Kansas State, um, Oklahoma that have just been running all over the place. And that's been an issue for Texas, who is struggled to hold on runners a little bit. Um, you know, Galvan has had, had his issues throwing out runners. Um, you know, a lot of that falls in the pitching staff. Um, you know, playing a team that is not going to put that pressure on the bases, that that could be nice for Texas and help the pitchers maybe, you know, take a deep breath out there and be able to focus on the hitters a little more than usual. Yeah. But Kansas, I mean, they've got some talent. They can, they've learned how to hit better in conference. You know, they actually have, they're one, they're one point better hitting and batting average than Texas is. 
if you only look at conference. Yep. But then you look at their pitching and, you know, it's a, they're, they're really bad. They're eight, four, two ERA in conference. Um, and so, yeah, that that's not good. Uh, their fielding hasn't been very impressive in conference either. You know, a lot of teams are batting up balls. So of course their defense is going to suffer and they're what nine, six, four, which is just two ticks above Baylor. And we saw how bad Baylor was. So yeah, it's, this is a sweepable series by all means. It's just, can Texas go out there and perform consistently? You know, we, we saw at TCU where it was hot, cold, sub freezing, and then they got hot towards the end, but they, if they can go out and just play very consistent ball, I, you know, yeah, I think they have a shot in all of them. Um, what did, what did you see from the starting pitching? Yeah. So, I mean, kind of running through those numbers, it's obviously we talked about the the conference numbers, not very impressive overall, but their best guy is definitely getting, you know, he's going to run out there on Friday against Lucas Gordon. That's Colin Bumgarner. Um, he's, he's four and one on the year. He's got a four, three, four ERA. He, he can, he can bring it up a little bit with the fastball. He can get up to, you know, 95. He'll sit in the low, low to mid nineties. Um, he, he's a big guy and he's definitely been the workhorse. Um, he, he, I looked at the, through the box scores. He's gone four to six, four to six innings in most of his starts this year, one to four earned runs. So he's just kind of a, he is going to go out there. He's a big, you know, six foot six righty. He's going to give you a chance to win the game. You know, it'll be up to the offense because, you know, Bumgarner, or at least at this point in the year, he's gone out there, you know, five innings, you know, three runs, four innings, five runs. He, he hasn't been dominant. You know, Texas should have their fair crack at some at some offense here, but he's definitely been their most reliable pitcher. And then you go to Saturday, you've got the righty Sam Ireland. He's got a six nine one ERA. Um he his um, whip is not as intact as Bumgarner there. He's had some more blow up starts. He's allowed. I noticed he's allowed 30 hits in his last four starts. So Texas will definitely have a chance to go for some big innings. And it'll be important to when you, you get the bases loaded with one out, you get second and third, nobody out. You got to cash him, get the get the crooked numbers up on the board, because Ireland is a guy that has been prone to crooked numbers this year. And then you look at Sunday, they're going to run. a. They might run a lefty out there, Ethan Bradford. He's really struggled lately. He has not been going deep into games at all. It's looked like they've been trying to use him as an opener, and he hasn't really been able to do that. He has been getting smacked around quite a bit lately. So we'll see what they do on Sunday. But I think Texas will have a good chance to go out there and, um, you know, kind of win it with the bats on Sunday. But, yeah, no, I mean, nothing in the starting rotation really pops off. Friday could be a little low scoring. We'll see what the weather's like. But then after that, you know, Texas should have an advantage on the bump and just overall with the guys that – Kansas will have left to run out there on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. And I was, I was looking at the, you know, just the the splits and everything. And um, I I think Texas will should fare better against the right-handers and maybe some of the other teams. Cause if you look at the splits for Texas, it's just, it's overpoweringly like they're a right-handed hitting team, even though, which doesn't make sense. They got a lot of lefties in the matchup, but um, Kansas has used Bumgarner and Ireland all season long as their Friday, Saturday guy. They have not yep. transitioned at all. Um, you know, Ireland came in from Minnesota and, you know, he was supposed to be the big arm on the team. He was supposed to be kind of the guy that has that next level stuff to get even into the MLB, but just really haven't seen it from him. You know, he's got a good fastball and a good, um, a really good changeup, but, you know, I don't know if he's just not shaping him well or if he's not locating because, as you said, he's been hit up a lot. And then Bradford, you know, he's been in and out of that Sunday role. He's been, he, last two weeks, yeah. he's been in the starter. The two weeks before that, it was uh, Cranton, who I think was an LSU transfer. And then, you know, before that, Bradford was back in there. And he's a Nebraska guy that, you know, he just, he's not bad. He, like, he has an okay fastball, but he's not going to overpower you. And um, as you said, he's, he does, hasn't been going deep in the game. So I don't know if it's not you know not having that release point or what the issue is but yeah um if you look at the relievers their their numbers aren't terrible um two right-handers and uh, two left-handers so trumper 3-3 three, three with a 4-3-6 three, ERA Hewlett he's a lefty he's 0-3 but he's got three saves and a 4-8-6 the right-hander um Dugan's 2-0 with one save and a 5-2-9 and then left-hander Brzozowski one and one with one save and he's got an ER in near six. So, you know, you look at their, their bullpen and you think these are all guys that are hittable. It's just can Texas again, be consistent and look for their pitches instead of chasing and and they should be all right. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's a very gettable pitching staff. It'll just be kind of the same thing that we talked about last week. I mean, never be, you know, don't get complacent. If you're up by five, you know, get up by 10. If you are up by 10, get up by 12. You know, if you're down by seven, keep swinging it because they just this Kansas pitching staff is susceptible to big innings like mo- most of the pitching staffs in the big 12. So we'll see how the park is playing. But yeah, I mean, you project it to be a pretty solid weekend for the Texas offense um, if they're able to get past Bumgartner there on Friday. All right, Zach, Texas needs a sweep this weekend. Two and one's got to be the bare minimum. What are you going with? Texas has been eight and six on the season on road games. Yep. I don't like that. Kansas, you never know what the weather's going to be. I'm hoping for some good weather, but I'll go two and one. Oof. I just, you know, I don't know. That that's that. Well, I guess Monday game sticks in my brain as like Kansas knows how to hit the ball. If Texas doesn't come and just like pitch well, they're they can score runs. I mean, K State and Kansas got into an eighteen to twenty one game yeah. earlier this season on a Sunday. So like they could be at the plate for six hours, right? Um, Don't say that, dude. Do not say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna go two and one. I. I think they have the ability. I think they can do it, but I need to see it. I, I really do need to see it. So, yeah, I mean, oh man, you talk about those other outs that they have to get. Um, Morehouse, uh, he he gave up like nine straight ground ball hits. They weren't all smoked. Um, so it's like a part of that was just bad luck and just very frustrating when you're on the mound. But he he didn't look great. Um, Charlie Hurley still doesn't seem like it's coming all together, but just like. When you look at the three, you know, kind of X factor guys that they really need to turn it around, being Morehouse, um, Travis Staley, and Charlie Hurley, it doesn't seem to be happening right now. So they they've still got to figure that out. But those do not seem like three guys that can be relied upon, you know, with a lot of confidence right now. Even though they might still have to run them out there at some point. Um, I'm going to choose to ignore that, and I'm going to go with a sweep for Texas. I'm going to say Texas goes three zero this weekend. Feel great about Lucas Gordon on Friday. I really do believe in what LBJ has done lately. Like I said, six of his past seven outings, zero or one earned run. Feel like he's going to give you six. Um, then I, I just feel like Texas is going to score a lot of runs on Saturday. So I feel good about Gordon Friday. Feel good about LBJ Saturday. Sunday, Tanner Wick can give me two scoreless. And then I'm just going to close my eyes. Maybe a couple DJ Burke innings. Maybe you get two from Heston Toll. You know, you throw an ace whitehead out there, I don't know, and then just let the bats win it. I mean, just hope the Kansas pitching staff is completely falling apart by then and Texas just gets into a slug fest and they're able to pull it out. That's kind of what I'm envisioning. Um, yeah. I, I do think Texas is going to sweep this weekend. So I'm going to go three and oh, and then we will we will see what happens. Yeah, and I just one thing before we move on, uh, I wanted to call out that somehow Kansas again has a, a star freshman from the state of Hawaii. We also what Maui Yahuna did for two years there, or three, two years, three years at Kansas. And now they've got Cody Shojinaga. Um, yeah, Hawaii rise up. This dude's just a freshman. He's hitting three, thir- uh, 366 in the Big 12, five home runs. He's on base for 10%. I mean, I don't know if the next Hawaiians wanted to get out of Kansas and move in a little sunnier pastures. Texas is there. I'm just saying. <laughs> who would have thought man just all those all those hawaiian kids out there you know surfing and then just playing baseball hitting <laughs> balls they just wake up dreaming of playing baseball in lawrence kansas that is apparently uh just how it goes out there i don't know if they get some really weird jacked up version of like espn plus where they only get kansas <laughs> games um i don't i'm not really sure what the pipeline is there but nonetheless um yeah i don't know how they keep getting these hawaiian guys but Zach, we have another uh, weird thing to talk about today that is definitely, uh, you know, the news broke kind of before we started recording this. University of Alabama, their head coach, Brad Bonahan, he has fired. Um, it was said a couple of days ago that all these sports books, they said, all right, we're no longer taking bets on uh, University of Alabama college baseball games for the rest of the year because of some suspicious activity on a Friday night game against LSU, the LSU won eight to six. Then, uh, you know, just three days later after word came out that they're going to be looking into that, Alabama just, you know, sends Bonahan out. He's gone. Um, this is just another recent scandal for Alabama. We, of course, just had a couple of weeks ago, Jamison Williams, the ex-Alabama wide receiver who now plays for the Lions. He got caught placing a bet inside the Lions facility, which is against the NFL rules. So he got suspended six games for gambling. 
So this is now two Alabama related betting scandals within like three weeks of each other. Zach, what is going on here? I mean, what, what were your first thoughts? What, why did this happen? You know, it was funny because when, so LSU played Alabama this past weekend in Baton Rouge, right? And maybe 30, 40 minutes before the game started game one on Friday night, they announced that the starting pitcher for Alabama was going to be out. He was, he was scratched. Um, and the Alabama's, they were doing well. I think they were up six to one at one point. And I was like, oh, wow, Alabama, go, go Alabama. And of course they lost it, you know, eight to six, you know, so it was a close game. And then the next two games, they end up losing. So they get swept. And immediately after the series, Ohio releases a statement. They're like, yeah, we're, we're shutting down any sports betting for Alabama baseball games due to irregularities. And at the time, everyone was like, well, that's really strange. But like, who the hell's betting on Alabama when facing the number one team in the nation in LSU? Like, it, are you really that crazy? Like, okay, sure. Go ahead. And supposedly at the time, it all stemmed from a number of bets that all started off as parlays that went straight to money line. Okay. Interesting. You've got them in a parlay and you think you're going to hit it big. It's still LSU, the number one team in the nation. I don't, I don't know what kind of intel you're gathering, but sure. Um, and then what yesterday or the day before yesterday, New Jersey comes out and says, we're suspending all betting on Alabama baseball games. It's like, what the hell is going on now? Like everyone thought it was just, you know, no big deal. And then, as you said, at the time, right before this was recorded, SEC releases a statement. Alabama released their coach due to ethical standards. And it's like, ooh, this is getting spicy. <laughs> I'm really glad you mentioned the pitcher getting scratched because this has just brought up something really funny to me. Because, like, you know how whenever in sports, when a pitcher, when any player is injured, they'll yeah. list the injury designation. So it'll be like, you know, you know, wit elbow or it'll be like you know just yeah. random player back stiffness i'm just picturing like an injury report where it's like alabama pitcher parentheses same game parlay <laughs> yeah. that's just all it says and they've got to throw that on the injury report but i mean yeah i mean it sounds like maybe the players were not involved which of course is would be the worst case scenario there but yeah, yeah man i'm just thinking like however the coach or whatever happened here however this group is trying to get around this how did they think they were going to get away with this college baseball is not a popular uh, it's not a popular gambling sport so like alabama baseball games there is not thousands of people betting on alabama baseball games any no. given weekend so any suspicious behavior is gonna pop like the sports book are gonna notice it if something really weird is going on like you talked about yeah i don't know how they thought they would get away with this i i hope we get the details because they will get incredible but i mean yeah i mean the best case scenario is just like the next time someone gets injured it's just like yeah no, you know, so-and-so is out, you know, had Bama money line in parentheses. <laughs> but uh, this is just in the state of Ohio of all things too. Like, like, what are they doing? So, yeah. No, yeah, I mean, I is Saban next? Well, what would Saban get caught for betting on? Would it just be like, you know, <laughs> de defensive back tackles and some random, you know, Thursday night football game? I don't even know. How, how many points am I going to beat one of my ex-assistants by? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. But, yeah. yeah, it's it's been, not been a good year for Alabama in general. You know, people are getting murdered over there by teammates, and their teammates are hiding the guns or giving them the guns. It's, yeah, very – it's not good news coming out of Alabama lately. <laughs> so. Yeah, they need to get it under control over there. This is a mess. But, uh, yeah, I mean, what are, what are some big series you want to go on? We've got a weird Big 12 – uh weekend this weekend it's not not exactly yeah. great but i'll let you go ahead and touch on the schedule and then some other uh, better series going on around the country yeah i mean if you look at series wise like the actual big 12 conference games it's only texas at kansas and oklahoma at west virginia uh otherwise texas tech's hosting sam houston tcu's hosting his former school uh school cal state's fullerton oklahoma's hosting east tennessee state that's sure. a wild matchup that i'm wanting to watch and then K-State is hosting Southeast Missouri State, which is actually not a bad school for baseball coming out of the Midwest. And then, uh, you know, Baylor just has the week off because, I don't know, Baylor's doing Baylor things. They're, I don't know what they're doing. Getting their own records in order, maybe. They're going to get swept. I, I've got I've got <laughs> off-week money line, minus 140. Baylor's getting swept. Irregular, irregularities on Baylor betting this weekend, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to place bets on bye week, and it's just it's not gonna go through. I'm gonna get suspended. <laughs> There's gonna be a whole orange blood statement that just said they had to release me because there was suspicious activity on 
Baylor baseball while they weren't even playing this weekend. It's it's going to be a whole mess. <laughs> and then nationally, probably not the greatest uh, greatest series out there. You got Stanford and Arizona State out west. That'll be some good late night action. Wake Forest is taking on Boston College. You know, can BC slow down the Rakers? Uh, the funny story that came out of Wake Forest this week was that one of the star pitchers, his econ professor, said that he was giving out like A's or something, or he was, I don't know, he was doing something for every time he shut a team out. I was like, great, no one's scoring another run on Wake Forest this season. Um, Tennessee, Georgia, that could be interesting. You know, Tennessee's back in the top 25 after a big weekend. You know, can they stay there? West Virginia and Oklahoma, we mentioned that. And then, uh, yeah, number six, Arkansas, who has another arm injury, which feels like it's like their entire staff this year. They're taking on Mississippi State. So Mississippi State's hurting. Maybe they are able to exact some revenge on Arkansas. I don't. I doubt it, but they yeah. fired their pitching coach this weekend or this week. Um, Mississippi State did. And, of course, all the rumors are swirled that Roy Oswalt's going to be their new pitching coach, which I would hate to see. But, um, yeah. Good times. Yeah, kind of kind of a down weekend against college baseball. Sounds like a good weekend to me to just lock in for Texas, Kansas, and then uh, check on everything else going around the sports world, spend some time with the family. But yeah, no, I mean, it'll be interesting. Nonetheless, it would really behoove Texas to get a sweep this weekend, but we will see if that will end up being the case. Of course, if you are not able to watch the games, you can follow us on Twitter. We're always providing updates. You can follow me at Aaron Little OB. You can find Zach at Zach at the Dish. If you are watching this on YouTube, please take the uh, couple seconds that it takes to hit the like button. You can drop a comment, um, subscribe to the channel. If you are listening to this as a podcast, which you can do now on Apple and on Spotify, go ahead and just leave us that five-star review. You can leave a comment there about the podcast. And then, yeah, I mean, besides that, just check out all the good stuff going on on orangebloods.com. We've got written stuff. We've got previews, game threads. We've got recaps. Um, Everyone can voice their opinions there during and after the games. But yeah, it's an exciting time. We are inching closer towards the conference tournaments. And then, Zach, before we know it, we will be previewing a regional, um, at least we hope. And then, yeah, I mean, that, that's when it gets real fun. Yeah, Big 12 tournaments coming up here very, very quickly. So um, should be a lot of fun up in Arlington. Uh, my truck will be silent by that time because my catalytic converters arrived this week. So <laughs> woohoo! game on, Arlington. Game on. <laughs> are you going back are you, are you planning on going to the big 12 tournament? Oh, I'm, I'm going i'm taking the truck and i'm just gonna like prowl the streets at 1 a.m in the morning just waiting for someone to try to steal them again so same hotel you just <laughs> no i got different hotel this time. <laughs> different hotel okay yeah i don't, I don't want to give too much information out there to the catalytic converter thieves that are <laughs> undoubtedly watching our show and just taking notes on how they can rip you off and make you drive around and something just just screaming loud <laughs> all year long but uh yeah, no, I mean, hopefully when we hopefully you got a little better luck this time around when we get to Arlington. Hopefully Texas has better luck when we, when we get to Arlington. Um, just yeah. a rough Arlington series all around that weekend. Just a rough, rough weekend all around. Yeah, it's it's taken everyone involved about three months to recover. Sounds like including your including your truck. So, uh, yeah. yeah, hopefully it works out there. But uh, with that, we will wish everyone a good weekend. I uh, hope you enjoyed the show. We will of course be back next week talking about. Texas and Kansas. And then I guess we might even preview San Jose state. If we feel about that, we might just make fun of Alabama for an hour. Um, We will see what happens there, but yeah, everyone enjoy the series this weekend. And then uh, we will be back next week. Subscribe to the channel. (laughs) Do it now.